Okay, so let's start to take a look at the more exciting of the non-fatal offences against the person. And in this video, we're going to look at assault occasioning actual bodily harm, or probably as we all know it, and we all refer to it as ABH. And I'll refer to it as ABH for most of the rest of this video. Um, and I will start again with the non-fatal offences pyramid. And this is now where we are starting. And the key difference that you should immediately note is that we're at the start of the statutory offences. Okay, if you remember, we've looked at assault and we've looked at battery and both of those were both created and defined in the common law. They're both known as collectively as common assault as a result. But now we're into the statutory offences and the uh, piece of statute that we are going to look at is the offences against the Person Act 1861, a very old piece of legislation and when we look at the review for that and the, the evaluation of that we'll discuss the problems that its age gives us. But this is forever known as the OAPA all right, and I'll refer to it probably as the OAPA throughout the Offences Against the Persons Act. An ABH, or Assault Occasion and Actual Bodily Harm, is the least serious of the non-fatal offences found in the Act. The problem with Section 47 is it states, uh, sorry, so I should have said, ABH is Section 47 of the Offences Against the Person Act. And you can refer to it as a Section 47 offence, you can refer to it as ABH, you can refer to it as its full title. But it's Section 47 of the Offences Against the Persons Act 1861. And the problem with Section 47 is, in short, it states the penalty only. So it only gives us the penalty, which forces us into an immediate problem. And that the elements of what we actually mean by what actual bodily harm is and how it can be committed, we have to find from the common law. That doesn't mean it's a common law offence. It's a statutory offence, which, um, which finds its elements, which is defined in its parts from cases in the common law. So what does the actual section say? Well, section 47 says, whosoever shall be convicted on indictment of any assault occasioning actual bodily harm shall be liable to imprisonment for any term not exceeding five years. That doesn't really help us when we want to look at demonstrating criminal liability for ABH. In fact, all that it says is that, in short, it is triable either way. So it's an either way offence. But if that conviction is one of uh, on indictment, so at the higher court, if it's one in the Crown Court, then the maximum term of sentence will be five years. So it's an either way offence for which the maximum sentence is five years. So what we need to do now, because if we go back to our liability equation, that definition gives us absolutely nothing. It doesn't help us at all. But what subsequent common law has demonstrated for us is that, in short, it's relatively straightforward. What do we need to show for the actus reus of ABH? Well, there are two key actus reus elements. The first, which are either of these, not both of them, just one of them, is that you have to show the presence of the actus reus of assault or the actus reus of battery. What that means is that the defendant must have caused another person to apprehend immediate and unlawful violence or they must have inflicted unlawful personal violence onto the person of another. So they must have put somebody in expectation of being harmed or they must have inflicted unlawful personal violence onto another person. So that's actus reus element one. What you have to have as well as one of these, so you have one of those plus that assault, so that expectation, or that actual infliction must lead to a level of harm that is the same as actual bodily harm. 
So I'll repeat that. The first element is that you have to demonstrate the actus reus of assault or the actus reus of battery. You have to show that somebody expected unlawful personal violence or that somebody had unlawful personal violence inflicted upon them. Then you have to show that that expectation or that infliction led to assault occasioning actual bodily harm. So the level of harm, so this talks about the level of harm, was ABH. So I'll do that through an example. If I slapped somebody across the face, that would then give me the actus reus one of battery. I have inflicted unlawful personal violence on them. What I now need to demonstrate is the slap is serious enough to produce a level of harm that gives us ABH. Hope that makes sense. If we have actus reus one and actus reus two, then we are able to show that the actus reus on our liability equation has been completed. So let's just take a look at one of two of these slight issues, but particularly, I'm not gonna deal with the actus reus of assault or the actus reus of battery because we've done those. What I am gonna do is just spend some time looking at what we mean by occasion and what we actually mean by actual bodily harm because that would be useful for us, wouldn't it? So what do we mean by occasion? Well, in simple terms, occasion means the same, believe it or not, as cause. So we now have cause, inflict and occasion, all of which means that the normal rules of causation exist. So occasion means to cause. And this is confirmed in the case of Roberts, 1971. All right, so Roberts says that occasion means cause and that the normal rules of causation exist. So that's not too difficult to grasp. The next thing we have to think about is what we mean by actual bodily harm. What level of harm is actual bodily harm? And for that, we need to go directly to case law. And the first case that I want to look at, and the one that gives us the uh, clear definition is the case of Miller. And Miller, um, I've put the, um, uh, that is supposed to be depicting a rape, it's the, it's the easiest way that I can think to give you a visual image of what that is, it's a, a, a classic painting. The defendant's wife leaves him, this is in 1952, and the following year she petitions for a divorce. Before the hearing, the defendant has sexual intercourse with her against her will. He throws her to the ground on three occasions and she was in an hysterical and nervous condition as a result of his actions. He was charged with rape and assault occasioning actual bodily harm contrary to section 47. The defendant, the rapist, relies on the fact that um, only up until recently marital consent was an exception to rape. If you were married you couldn't rape your wife. And he also claimed that nervous shock does not amount to a bodily harm. The judge gave this definition. The judge was Lord Justice Linsky. And he gave this definition of what actual bodily harm means. He says that actual bodily harm, and I love this, it, it, it almost trips off the tongue. It's a beautiful um, it's a, a beautiful phrase to remember and, and is something that you should commit to memory quite quickly. He says that ABH is such hurt or injury calculated to interfere with the health and comfort of the victim. Such hurt or injury need not be permanent but must no doubt be more than merely transient and trifling. So what that means is that if it was a slapped face and that was just some localised reddening of the skin that lasted 10-15 minutes, that would be transient and trifling. So it has to be an injury or a hurt that is calculated to interfere with the health and comfort of the victim. So that seems relatively straightforward. And what I absolutely implore you to do is to commit that 
to memory. So as when you are asked in a question, you are easily able to say the definition of what constitutes ABH can be found in Miller 1954 and is such hurt or injury calculated to interfere with the health and comfort of the victim, providing that that hurt is more than merely transient and trifling. Now, there is one additional element to this, and that is, um, in fact, what I'll do is I'll tell you the facts of Chan Fook and then I'll tell you what Chan Fook does. Chan Fook's an interesting case, and we'll see it again in a moment. There are two key things to come from it as far as we're concerned. But in Chan Fook, a French student was lodging at the house of Mrs. Fox, who was engaged to the appellant, so the, the defendant in the, in the court of first instance. Mrs. Fox's engagement ring went missing and she accused the student of stealing it. The appellant, the defendant, interrogated the student during which time he struck him several times. He then locked him in an upstairs cupboard or a room and threatened him with further violence if the ring was not returned. The student attempted to escape by roping the curtains and sheets together and tying them around a curtain pole. The curtain pole broke and the student fell to the ground and suffered a fractured wrist and a dislocated hip. The appellant, the defendant, was charged with the offence of section 47 ABH. The prosecution did not frame the case in relation to the physical injuries sustained from jumping out of the window, and I'm guessing that's probably because they thought that it was he didn't pass the Daphnis test, you know, the Roberts Daphnis test, and therefore there was probably, for the physical injury, a novus actus. But where they did frame it was they based their case on the mental state of the victim and the fear and panic that he would be suffered. Now, I'll come on to the importance of that second part in a moment, but what I want to do is just to demonstrate to you that what Chan Fook tells us is the injury should not be so, let's just write this down, should not be so trivial as to be wholly insignificant. OK, so that's the key thing, is that it should not be so, the injury should not be so trivial as to be wholly insignificant. So those two things together help us to see what is ABH and what is not ABH. Now, over recent years, that definition has been extended. And there are two. Let's have a look what ABH can include. In DPP versus Smith... The defendant caused actual bodily harm to the victim by cutting off her ponytail. He went to the home of his ex-partner and cut her ponytail off with a pair of kitchen scissors. The magistrates accepted that there was no actual bodily harm and the Director of Public Prosecutions appealed. The appeal judge said that cutting off a person's hair amounted to ABH. So cutting off hair... equals ABH. Harm, the judge says, that harm was not limited to injury of the skin, flesh and bones and extended to hurt and damage. That the hair cut was dead tissue was not relevant at all. An, an obiter comment, so something that was said that didn't go to the actual decision, was that if paint or some other unpleasant substance were to be put on a victim's hair, that could also amount to actual bodily harm. So that's just worth remembering. But our definition from Miller has now extended to cutting off hair. Cutting off hair would be considered ABH. And what Chan Fook says is Chan Fook adds, you remember we've just discussed that, it adds psychiatric injury. And I've got there it equals ABH, but actually what the judge says is it could be ABH or GBH depending on the level of psychiatric injury. So do you remember that the, the prosecution did not rely on the physical injury, probably because they felt that the defendant broke the chain of cause, the victim broke the chain of causation. But what they did rely on was the psychiatric harm caused to the, um, to the defendant. And the last part of that, the judge says, feelings of fear and panic are emotions. So emotions not allowed. 
So no fear, no panic. They are not included. However, if you have medical evidence, so you need, if there's medical evidence, to support a recognised psychiatric condition, a conviction for ABH could stand. So we've got two, we've extended now, we've extended the definition from Miller, and that's part of the issue here. Miller can almost now be seen to be somewhat inadequate. Partly because psychological injury, psychiatric injury, can be quite severe. So we have Miller, which gives this notion of um, a, a, a low level, if you like, health and comfort, the victim. We then have Chan Fook in 1994, which held that the body is not limited to flesh, skin and bones, but includes organs, nervous systems and brains even though it says that fear and, and emotion and distress are excluded. We then looked at the two cases, if you remember, of Ireland and Burstow, which were 98 cases, and we looked at those and we looked at assault, didn't we? And Ireland and Burstow confirmed Chan Fook and held that psychological injury, so psychological injury was okay. You could use it can amount to ABH but what it says and confirms again is that that has to be expert evidence associated with that. What Burstow goes on to suggest even further is that psychological injury can be GBH and lastly the last case which goes also late 1998 which is Morris says that in relation to psychological injury, expert evidence must be given by a psychiatrist and not a general practitioner. Okay, so let's just, let's just look at the extension. I still want you to use Miller when you talk about what ABH is. Any hurt or injury calculated to interfere with the health and comfort of the victim, providing it's more than merely transient or trifling. But just be aware that from 94 through 98, there was an extension of that to include psychological injury, started by Chan Fook, supported by Ireland. Burstow goes one step further to say that that could be GBH as well, providing that you have expert evidence. And Morris says that expert evidence must be from a psychiatrist, not from a GP. So we've extended the boundaries, have we not, of what, um, ABH is. And just very, very briefly, if I can find it, I just want to just give us some examples of what we mean by ABH. We're talking about a temporary loss of sensory function, extensive or multiple bruisings, minor cuts that require stitching, and minor fractures. These would be sort of fingers and things like that, so fingers and small bones in the body. And if you consider the definition, all of these things will disrupt the health and comfort of the victim. Anybody that's been extensively bruised will know just how painful that can be. It is uncomfortable. But you'll know that it's extensive or multiple takes some time before it goes away. And therefore that would fit the uh, interfere with the health and comfort, but it would also be more than transient and trifling. So remember what I said, do not rely on the joint charging standards, but use it just to give you some idea of the sorts of um, injuries that will fall within ABH. Okay, I hope that's relatively clear. Miller is the key piece of case law that you need um, in, in order to demonstrate what, what ABH is. And the other cases just help to extend that, whether that's DPP versus Smith for haircutting or Chan Fook. Ireland and Burstow and Morris to look at the issue of psychiatric harm. Finally, and I'll go to the top of this, we're going to talk about mens rea. And mens rea is complex, okay? Mens rea is complex in, in um, ABH. It is a basic intent crime. So that means it can be committed either intentionally or with cunning and subjective recklessness. 
What is surprising, if we remember that one of the central tenets of English law is that you have to demonstrate that you have the guilty mind to commit the offence that you are being charged with. That is not necessarily true in terms of ABH. In terms of ABH, and I'm sorry, there's a spelling mistake, but in terms of ABH, it is the intention or cunningham subjective reckless to cause another person to apprehend immediate and unlawful personal violence, which effectively is common assault, or to apply force to the person of another, which is battery. So the mens rea relates only to the first part of the actus reus, number one, the uh, assault or the battery. Therefore, the mens rea of ABH is identical to the mens rea of assault or battery. For that reason, it's known as half mens rea. Because you only require the mens rea for the first part of the actus reus. You do not need mens rea, you do not need the intention or subjective recklessness for the second part. I'll demonstrate that in a moment, but I just want to go, the case that we use is Savage. It's a joint herd case, Savage and Parmita, but we'll just stick with Savage. And in the case of Savage, the defendant pours her drink over the victim's head, which is a battery. As part of that battery, the glass slips out of her hand and smashes and cuts the victim. Her conviction under section 47 related to the injury. Her appeal against conviction, so her, her conviction at section 47 related to the glass. Her appeal against conviction was based on a lack of mens rea. She argued that she neither intended injury nor foresaw that injury would be caused. She never for one second thought the glass would slip. She just wanted to pour beer over um, uh, uh, the victim's head. The House of Lords dismissed the appeal, holding that mens rea of section 47 required intention or subjective recklessness in relation to the common assault or battery only. There is no requirement of intention or foresight in respect of the injury caused by the assault or battery. What that means is the actus reus for, us, for ABH is either common assault or battery that leads to actual bodily harm. The mens rea is only the intention or recklessness to commit the common assault or battery. There is no requirement that the defendant intends to cause ABH or that he foresees a risk that ABH will occur as a result of his actions. All right, And because of that it's known as half mens rea. As we will see in subsequent videos, this is open to a huge amount of criticism because it, it goes against some of the central tenets of English law. But nevertheless, for us, just remember that the defendant only needs the mens rea for the common assault or the battery and does not have to necessarily foresee the actual bodily harm that was, uh, that, that, that was resulted. I hope that's been useful and I hope that you've understood all of the things that we've talked about today. ABH is relatively straightforward. The actus reus is simply either the actus reus of assault or the actus reus of battery plus a level of harm that amounts to actual bodily harm. And we use Miller to define that as um, hurt or injury uh, that is calculated to interfere with the health and comfort of the victim, which need to be more than permanent and must be no doubt more than merely transient and trifling. Thank you.